Here's a sagittal view of the uterus. And in this illustration, it shows you how uh, the peritoneum covers the viscera. And in doing so, it creates these pouches that you have to make. Here's the peritoneum covering there, and it, there's a little recess there. goes around the uterus, a little recess there. There's the rectum. So the space between, the pouch between um, the bladder and the uterus is the vesico-uterine pouch. The pouch between the uterus and rectum is the recto-uterine pouch. And those aren't on the male because men don't have a uterus. So I know those for the female. pouches in front of and in back of the uterus. Vesico okay. <coughs> uterine pouch. Recto so this kind of gets us started with studying the uterus. These are the spaces in front and behind. And to help you remember, vesico, the vesicle is just a, a vessel. It refers to the urinary bladder. Let's remember that the uterus is flexed over it normally. If we take a posterior view, and then we uh, section open the uterus, we have this view. And they've cut all the way through so you can see the insides of the oviducts or the uterine tubes along with the uterine cavity inside of the uterus. The uterus is basically an upside down pear shape. And um, <coughs> uterus is a Latin word for womb. For pregnancy, yeah. 38 weeks of gestation. Yeah, it's for it, what I said earlier was the cavity here receives a blastocyst for implantation. Yeah, that's the way it's for. We'll, we'll get into that. Let's just kind of learn the anatomy, just the parts here. Um, there, there are regions which include. Well, let me kind of use the pen feature and just kind of like color code it here. Let's see. Zoom in a little. The superior round part, it's called the fundus. The majority of the uterus, I'll use blue, different color, say from there to there, is the body. Now, I'll, I'll draw a singular line there. That's at the level of, they call it the isthmus. You can see it there. It's the part where the uterus constricts. It's at the level of the internal os. Well, anyways, below that green line, I guess, uh, let's see, here's another color. The inferior one-third about, that, that's cervix, the neck of the uterus. Okay, so you got on this of oh, uterus. Mm. Use blue for the body of uterus. At the level of the green line, the constriction isthmus which means narrow, narrowest part.
So it's at the same level of internal os. And, and I say that because on some models, you can't see where the constrictor is. They just show it all the same. So if you can identify the internal os, which is always shown, you can identify the isthmus region of the uterus. Inferior to that is the cervix. Now, I don't have yellow, so I'll just put cervix. Like your cervical vertebra, that's the vertebra of your neck. Cervix means neck. This is the quote unquote neck. Of uterus. <clears throat> it's the one that nurses and doctors can exam to admit a mom who's having labor contraction. They kind of examine it to see if you're really ready to be admitted to the hospital for labor and delivery. They check for, well, I'll get into it. They check for things like dilation and talk about it later. <clears throat> Anyways, that's the regions. Um, You also have layers of the uterine wall. There are three. Okay. On this figure, they show you the, the endometrium and the myometrium. I'm just calling this the layers of the uterine wall. I'll go from outer to inner. Now, the outermost one actually isn't even shown here. But um, what we do know is that it's covered with a peritoneum. So let me go back just one slide to this, to this view here. So that red line that I showed you is the outermost layer of the uterine wall. And it's called a parametrium. Basically, it is the peritoneum covering the uterus called perimetrium. Basically, peritoneum. That's what it is. <coughs> you want to think of the uterus as a muscle because it has to like push baby out during labor and delivery. And that's the most significant part of the wall is the myometrium. They need bundles of smooth muscle, myometrium. Bundles of smooth muscle. And let's remember, what helps it contract is when it, um, it's targeted by the hormone oxytocin. Okay. We learned that from endocrine. The innermost lining is the endometrium. That's important because that is the innermost layer, so it will receive the um, blastocyst for implantation should one arrive. This is the layer. Well, there's a couple of sublayers within this layer. There's what they call the stratum functionalis and the stratum basalis. The basal layer, the base, is on the bottom. Uh, but it has no function, really, that I talk about. Uh, the other one does, the functional layer.
That's the layer that's hormone sensitive. We, we, we mentioned them in the previous chapter, endocrine, you know, basically estrogen and progesterone. They respond and it, it thickens and then it sloughs off, thickens, sloughs off with each menstrual cycle. <clears throat> It proliferates you know, to get ready for pregnancy. And if you're not pregnant, start over. Just hit the reset button and, well, we have menses. Or the, this, this stratum functionalis comes off, sloughs off. Stratum vitalis does not slough off. It remains during menses. Just rebuild on top of that base. Menstruation. <clears throat> Let's look at a picture of these two functional layers and basal layers on the next slide. Uh, right here. Out the lights, you can see a little better. Okay, well, what we got on the bottom is a portion of the myometrium. And try to train your eye to tell the difference between myometrium, smooth muscle, and what's above it. Endometrium, basically not smooth muscle. There you go, myometrium up above. See where the tissue starts to change right around there? That's what um, endometrium looks like. You got the base layer. You got the functional layer on top, the part that thickens and sloughs off with each menstrual cycle. We see the blood supply coming off the uterine artery. I would note the spiral arteries. Okay, and there's venous drainage too, but let's note the spiral arteries of the endometrium. Because they proliferate along with the uterine glands each cycle to get ready for pregnancy. And a woman may say to herself, I'm not getting ready for pregnancy, but your body is every month. Okay, and this is the physiology of how. One thing that proliferates are the spiral arteries. They get more numerous, more torturous. They proliferate, that means become more numerous, along with uterine glands, also called glycogen glands. That's what they secrete nourishment for the baby, or what first arrives is just a ball of cells called the blastocyst, should one arrive. Uh, so I'll, I'll go over the, uh, the, the ovarian menstrual cycle in detail later, but just to give me an overview now, basically you got a 28 day cycle. What did I say happens? Ovulation. That's the first receives, right? Everything's going normal. Of course, the cycle could be 21 days, it could be 35 days. Most textbooks just teach the typical monthly or 28 day cycle. So that's the day. So, I mean, let's say you weren't pregnant the last cycle. Menses usually begins on day 28. Okay, to day five.
you weren't pregnant. You got your period, and people know that you weren't pregnant because it sloughed off. There was no implantation. If there was, it would have happened on, on or around this day, and you would have missed your period because the endometrium would remain to support the pregnancy. And we'll get into the details of that. But basically, I'm just trying to give you an overview here. So let's say you weren't pregnant. So basically, day five to day 13, you know, they call it the proliferative phase. You just kind of start anew, just start rebuilding for the next pregnancy. start building it up, and the hormone that drives it is estrogen. It's rebuilding. The estrogens, like, you know, estradiol, estrone, I, I mentioned those before. Let's look at a picture of it. The microscope here. Here's a picture of a uterus in, well, during the proliferative phase. Now, the, the ovary would be in the follicular phase, you know, as you go through primary, secondary, graphian. The uterus is proliferating, getting ready for that. You have, this is before ovulation, correct? Like you're, you're getting ready for ovulation. Because if you ovulate and you fertilize on day 14, about a week later, you want to be ready for implantation. So what happens after Let's say this time you are going to get pregnant. Um, you ovulate and you fertilize on day 14. What happens from, like, I don't know, say day 15 to 27, I guess? From like there to there, they call it the secretory phase, and it's driven by the hormone progesterone. where the functional layer becomes a secretory mucosa. gestation, pregnancy. So this means before pregnancy. It's like, can, this is right before pregnancy. Because if you conceive, it's on day 14. And about a week later, you have implantation. So a week, what's one week after 14? 21. So you're right in the middle of the secretory phase when the endometrium is primed and ready for implantation. Okay. Let's look at a picture of a uh, secretory phase. So what you see here is, I, I used a low mag, and the endometrium is so thick, I couldn't even get the myometrium in the field of vision. So it's all endometrium. Look at the numerous uterine glands. They're like sawtooth, they're so big. It's a secretory mucosa. Uh, during this part of the um, uterine cycle, a woman might notice uh, a discharge. If you compare, to proliferative, there's less numerous smaller glands, and they definitely proliferate because by the time you get the secretory, that's what you got. They already have proliferated. Uh, okay. So this is post ovulation, right? Let's go to the uterine tube. Any questions on? Uh, the layers of the endometrium. The endometrium, the myometrium, functional layer, basal layer, and basic stuff. <coughs> I zoomed in on this slide to show you, it was the same one we looked at, I just kind of zoomed in on the, uh, the uterine tube, and there are different parts that we're going to define. This is the tube that receives the ovulated oocyte.
I'll go from out to in. So the, the, the little fingertips are called the fimbrae. Okay. They say at abdominal osteum. Normally these envelop and, and wrap around the ovary to catch the uh, ovulation. But you know, they could be separated like that. If you ovulate and then you catch here, you'll just lose the egg to the peritoneal cavity. And I guess you could fertilize here, but you, you never make it. I have heard of cases where you fertilize in the cavity next to the iliac artery, which is in the pelvis, and then I heard a case where it went to full term. They call that ectopic pregnancy, where the pregnancy is occurring outside the womb. Right? Normally, we don't want that. Uh, sometimes it happens inside the uh, uterine tube, and that's an emergency surgery where you have to abort to save the mother's life. This cannot sustain a pregnancy. This can. This is where you want it. Well, anyways, the parts of the uterine tube are and I still use the term oviduct. There's an older term called fallopian tube I, I don't use anymore, but fimbrae is the first part of the uterine tube. Most of it. And that's the typical site of fertilization. The part where it gets constricted and narrow is the isthmus of the uterine tube, because you have an isthmus of the uterus as well, so don't confuse the two. And then the part that actually goes through the uterine wall is the uterine part of the uterine tube. Okay. It goes through the walls of the uterus. So basically it allows it to be continuous with the uterine cavity. That's what I'm writing. Continuous with uterine cavity. Here's the next slide, and I think this model that we have, um, I want to use to kind of show you if I'm tagging something for a test, what you think it would be. If I tag it at the super edged ridge, what do you think I'm going for? Thin brain. What if I, um, you know, I forgot a part. I forgot infundibulum, right there. Write that down. I'm going to add, squeeze it in there. You had an infundibulum for pituitary as well. It just means connecting stock. So, fibrinary, infundibulum. So, let me go back to that other picture. If I tag it there, fimbrae. So if I tag right above it, I'm going for infundibulum. If I tag anywhere along here, most of the tube, I'm going for ampulla. But what if I get this part really close? Isthmus, the part that goes through the uterine part of the uterine tube. Okay, so that model shows the parts nicely. Uh, this slide shows you what the Oviduct looks like in cross section under a microscope. Um, so what we see here is that the tube is it's not round. The lumen is not round. There's all these like uh, well, basically how I describe it is the oocyte has a lot of nooks and crannies to rest in as it awaits to be fertilized. If you take a close look at the epithelium, 
Most textbooks would describe it as a simple columnar, but it looks pseudostratified to me. So that's why I put ciliated simple columnar UT. I'll accept either, because most of our slides make it look pseudostratified. There's what the book says, and there's what my eyes see. So I, I kind of trust my eyes more, but I don't want to ignore what all the books say either. So um, Always trust your eyes. Lined with it, ciliated, pseudostratified. Columnar ET. But because most books say it's a simple columnar, if you put that on a quiz, I would accept it. When I present it to you, I don't, I don't think it's going to look simple. We'll see. I want to talk about. Um, ligaments that support the uterus, and I want to make sure I talk about the ligaments that support the ovary first. So I want to go back to this picture here because it shows one of the ligaments of the ovary I didn't mention yet. The, uh, the ovary has a couple of ligaments here. Here's the ovary. I did talk about the mesovarium, but I didn't talk about this one going from uterus to ovary. It's the proper ovarian ligament. So let me, it's not labeled. Let me write it on the board. You don't have to put proper, but definitely call it ovarian ligament or proper ovarian ligament. Not shown, but usually there's another ligament going to the side here, and it contains ovarian vessels. So those are two ligaments that do support, it would be here, but they don't have the pelvis here, the, the one on each side, uh, suspending the ovary and the uh, uterine cavity. Out the lights. So here's a superior view. Let's see if we can tell what we're looking at here. In the middle, I see uterus. Let me point to it. <coughs> Here is the proper ovarian ligament, ovary, uterine tube associated <coughs> with it. See that ligament right there? That, that would be the suspensory ligament. Proper ovarian ligament, suspensory ligament right there. <coughs> <Okay. coughs> there are some ligaments of the uterus I want you to know too. And this picture shows you side by side, if you dissect away the peritoneum and you get a point of view <coughs> of the um, uterine ligaments, there's three. One, two, three. Green here. 
that's the uterosacral ligament. There's one going to the side here. That's the transverse or cardinal ligament that I just colored in blue. And there's one going forward. I mentioned it before, it's the round ligament. In men, it's the spermatocord. Okay, so know those three ligaments of the uterus. Sometimes it's called the cardinal ligament. And the one going anteriorly is going to go into the inguinal canal, just like the spermatocord did, but in females, it is the round ligament of the uterus. Round ligament. It's going to anchor inside the labia inside the inguinal canal. You know, we have a, a model in the room that shows that I, I have plenty of pictures of our models in the study guide. A couple of them are shown here that we've been talking about. Here's the round ligament. Just to orient you, I put it in the same orientation as the picture. So you got round ligament, proper ovarian ligament, and there's a little fold there. Okay, that's where the uterosacral ligament would be. Although they don't, they don't really show it, so it's kind of hard to say it. They don't show it, but that's where it should be. Here's a picture showing you what's from the atlas, and it, they do show you the round ligament um, anchoring in the labia. There's a superficial inguinal ring in females, and there's the picture we studied in males, full-on spermatic. Here's another picture. Here's a uh, frontal view, coronal plane, of the transverse cardinal ligament. It helps prevent what's called a uterine prolapse, where the uterus prolapses into the vaginal canal. That, that could happen, say, after delivery, where all these things are expanded and weakened, and you could have a prolapse in there. And this helps prevent that. So that red arrow is pointing to the transverse or cardinal ligament in both, in both pictures. I'm going to move on from the ligaments to vagina. Uh, about vagina, it's, it's about three or four inches in length. It's a fibromuscular tube from there to there. Okay. Remember, vagina means sheath, so it's the sheath for the penis during intercourse. It's also the birth canal for a vaginal birth. writing three to four inches in length. So the vagina and the cervix are considered the birth canal. And if mom is having trouble dilating, during labor, uh, the doctor may make a call and say, okay, we do a C-section, which is where you just deliver right through the uterine wall. Okay? But a vaginal birth is push baby out um, through these structures. Okay? Let's see here. Oh, okay, let's not forget the fornix. That's its association with um, the cervix. said earlier is uh, that's kind of where the seminal pool is after sex. And you can see from the picture that um, 
the, the cervix will kind of like dip down into it and that's how the sperm can get in through the cervical canal. So note for the cervix, I'm gonna put it under a vagina because it's associated with it. You have external os. That would be the opening of the cervix that has access to the sperm right there. Then you have a little canal, cervical canal, and an internal os. Really, I should have mentioned it when I first mentioned cervix, but well, you've got it now. Boom, boom, and then internal os. So before and next, that's where the sperm could be, then it has to swim through these structures to get into the uterine cavity, then onto the uh, oviduct. Okay. So not a part of this region, but a part of repro are the mammary glands. And we mention them in repro because um, after birth for a nursing mother, There are the mammary glands and then the lactiferous ducts. The breast is basically fatty tissue and it's attached by the, to the uh, pectoral region by the suspensory ligaments. Basically, these are the breasts, but I call them mammary glands because I'm concerned with first milk production in the, like, in the mammary. The mammary lobes basically contain the mammary glands. why we're all mammals, the one who basically feeds their young with milk. Okay. Uh, memory glands produce milk. And I'll put PRL parentheses to remind you that that's the hormone that helps make that happen. The suckling baby, we have milk let down through the Tiferous ducts. I've heard that the duct structures are the ones that are prone to breast cancer. Uh, but for us, lactiferous ducts, the smooth muscle um, is targeted by oxytocin, which allows for milk let down. So, oxytocin that allows for milk. Hard to see here on this view, but there's nipple areola tissue. And the areola is the brownish tissue that surrounds the nipple. So I'll put nipple slash areola. Now the areola may appear bumpy due to uh, spacious glands. slides are just models. I got, I got plenty of model pictures for you in the map study guide. That concludes uh, the anatomy. Uh, I'm going to stop here. Uh, if you look at the clock, there's time. If you'd like to stick around and start to study the models independently, you can. I don't have a lab plan for today. I do for Monday, though. I'll, I'll provide it in class. There's nothing you got to print out. Okay. All right, so yeah, class dismissed unless you want to stay and study. I, I will stay here.